All right. All right. So as you prepare for the final, here is without doubt the most common stumbling block where things go south, and that's the planetary motion equations. Okay? That is without doubt where the wheels fall off. So let's kind of start with that. <laughs> okay? So this is whose third law? Kepler. Kepler. Okay? Wait, Kepler. Kepler's third law. So. Can we throw it? Like, do we need another name for it? No. Sorry, okay. Have you ever multiple choice question? What is the name of this car? <laughs> Have I ever given you a question like that? I wish. No, I have I have I wish KJ teacher Okay. <laughs> now, let's kind of look at where this whole idea comes from, okay? So, remember, Kepler did this in the early 1600s. Newton was born in the mid-1600s. So, nobody actually understood why it worked. So, but if you're Kepler, here's what you have to remember. Did you actually know the distance to, from the Earth to the Sun? No. You did not know the actual distances. He was all about ratios, right? Uh -huh. He was all about the ratios. So, what would he let the radius of the Earth be? One, One astronomical unit. Then if he was dealing with Mars, this would be a multiple of, it would be some number, one, like two, three, or four, that's the number of This would be the period most likely measured in? Passion. No. <laughs> years. Years. Okay. He doesn't work in order. He doesn't want to work in 365.25 days. Man doesn't have a calculator. Okay. So he wants to use a numeric value of one every chance that he gets. So what has to happen for these two things to work? What, are, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do they have to orbit? Same the same center, yeah. right? Okay. Now, so Newton comes along and he says, "Wow, <coughs> if you look at the idea that centripetal force is what's creating the gravitational force," he says, "All right, well, that's a cool idea." And he says, "All right, hey, uh, that centripetal force to keep it in orbit Can you is really see this? big G times the mass of the Earth." Or whatever, what, excuse me, this is your centrifugal force. Can Ellie see this? Is it thick enough? Oh, that's true. Yeah, I better list. I'll start off, I'll, I'll, I'll write paper. Okay. You're welcome. What does that say? Yeah. FC equals FG? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where's Ellie? She's uh, taking her C and A test. Yeah, Okay. So, Newton comes along and he says, okay, let's talk about the, the Earth, okay? So this would be the mass of the Earth times 4 pi squared r over t squared. Okay? So this would be the centripetal force needed to keep the Earth in orbit around the sun. Okay, cool. And then he goes, all right, that's going to equal big G, the mass of the sun, times the mass of the Earth over r squared. Now remember, Newton actually never came up with the numeric value of g. He just said it's a constant <coughs> proportionality. So if we set these things equal, what happens to the mass of the Earth? Those cancel out. Okay? So whatever is orbiting doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what's at the center of the orbit. Okay, so for example, if you look at all the satellite problems I gave you, I never gave you the fact that the, that the satellite was painted red. Do you know why? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay? Do you wonder why I never gave you the mass of an orbiting satellite? It doesn't matter. Okay? It's not in the equation if you tried. So, what we did is we cleaned this thing up a little bit. Okay? And we did some cross multiplication, and we came up with this idea, and this is like the Swiss Army knife equation. And we said that 4 pi squared r cubed equals big G times the mass of the Earth, whatever you've got, times t squared. Okay? And we said, okay, well, that's cool, right? So what we're looking at here is that let's say, for example, 
we're talking about the Earth. Okay? So this would be the Earth, and this would be the Earth. Okay? And, or excuse me, this, and then this would be, this is going to be important, this would be the mass of the Sun. So if you're talking about the Earth orbiting around the Sun, this would be the mass of the Sun, this would be the period of the Earth, this would be the radius of the Earth, 4 pi squared, or cool. And so Newton says, hey, well, what if we did a comparison? What if we compared, say, here's the Sun, here's the Earth, and here's Mars. Now, you've got to keep in mind, Newton is doing this years, 100 years after Kepler had published his works. So he says, what if we kind of do a comparison of the orbital period of the Earth and the orbital period of Mars? Okay, well, let's set this as a ratio. And then, so I'm going to take this, so this is what I would need for the Earth. And then Newton comes along and says, what if we did that same thing for Mars? Oh, okay, so that would be 4 pi squared times the radius of Mars cubed equaling big G times the mass of the Sun times the period of Mars squared. So, oh, that's a ratio, right? That's kind of cool. Well, what happens to the 4 pi squares? They all cancel out. What happens to the big G and the mass of the Sun? They all cancel out. What are you left with? Wow. Kepler's third law. Okay? So Kepler's third law is proven by Newton's laws of, grand, of planetary motion. So, literally, as the story goes, a colleague of Newton was sitting around talking, and they were talking about Kepler's works and, and the whole gravity thing, and he goes, man, nobody knows why Kepler's laws work. And Newton says, oh, I've had that solved for a couple of years. And the guy goes, Really? He goes, yeah. So this, according to the story, he even goes over to his desk and he pulls it out of the drawer. And he has this whole, basically this, everything worked out like this. And the guy says, why didn't you publish this? Why didn't you let the world know about this? And Newton kind of says, I don't know. I had some other things to do. I just kind of forgot all about it. And it's like, yeah, not a big deal. And so, so <laughs> Newton supposedly had this whole thing resolved and why Kepler's laws work, and just never got around to telling anybody until a friend of his happened to bring that up. So, anyway, so this works because of this. So, that was the beauty of what Newton was able to do. Okay, so let's talk about the functional part of these equations. Where does that radius have to be measured from? Center of... Yes, it's a center to center distance. It's not from the surface, okay? It has to be from the center. What units does this have to be in? These have to be meters. If you're using this equation, anytime you see anything involving big G, and anytime you're involving big G, it is the MKS poster child, okay? <clears throat> the radius has to be in meters, the period has to be in Seconds. Seconds. <laughs> Seconds, right? Mass has to be in okay. kilograms. Okay. So if you're just in Kepler's third law and it's just a ratio, it doesn't matter. But whenever you're doing anything involving big G, so as, you, as soon as you see a calculation that involves big G, you remember this is the MKS poster child. You only works in meters, kilograms, and seconds. So, let's kind of start at, on a journey. Let's say that uh, here's this rock that we're fortunate to live on, and we've got a rocket, okay? And here's Mars, and Mars is moving along in its orbit, and this rock that we're on is spinning. Okay, so let's start a journey. Let's, first thing we've got to be able to do is get the rocket off the launch pad, right? Because okay, we can't do that if we really can't get here, right? So, uh, what are the forces acting on the rocket? I think gravity's pulling down, that's kind of a thing, right? Okay, so you got some FG, and what do you need to calculate that? This is just a rocket. Don't, 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 don't go over to density overload. Oh, I've got to have the density of the rocket and the volume of the rocket. No, we're not doing the Rho VG thing in this one. Okay, this is old school. What do you need? Mass of the rocket and the 
G. Okay? All right, that's kind of cool. Now, let's talk about G. Let's say we don't know what little G is. Okay? It's like we're starting over from way scratch. Okay? We're, we're, we're way scratch. We don't even know what little G is. So, what's the equation to calculate little G? Yeah, that is my, my rap name on the weekends, little G. So, little G equals, there's no square root, my bad, false alarm. Big G. Big G. Mass of the earth, in this case, over R squared. Okay, so if we happen to know the mass of the earth. Caleb, okay, did you just remember that? No. <laughs> you were really impressed, weren't you? I was about to say, wow. <laughs> okay. So, this is what we can calculate little g, right? So, this is your gravitational acceleration. So, if we have to know the mass of the Earth, we know the radius, we can calculate little g, we got this. So, if we're going to get off the launch pad, what do we have to have? Force. A force that is bigger than g. that gravitational force, right? So, let's say this is... Uh, 10,000 newtons. Okay, you want to make that negative? That's kind of a cool deal. So, how much upward force do I have to have? 10,000. At minimum of 10,001. Okay? Yeah, anything bigger than this, right? So, in the, in the vernacular of forces, is this my FAP or my FINET or my FOP? That's my opposing force, right? This is the, this is the gravity mafia, right? So this is what has to be paid. So I got this going down, right? So if we want to go to Mars, guess what? The first thing that we have to do is generate a force that's bigger than that. So let's say that we want to produce a force of 10,100 newtons, okay? Right? It's nice. So if I take 10,100, which is my applied force, and that's my opposing force, and what's my net force? Positive 100. Positive 100, right? So I got a 10,100 Newton force going up, I got a negative 10,000 Newton force going down. The difference between those two is 100 Newton. So my finet is going to be 100 Newton. Now, how can I get my acceleration knowing my finet? F equals ma. F equals ma, right? So Let's say that uh, the mass of the rocket is a uh, uh, hundred, let's say a thousand kilograms, okay? So I can take 10 newton, 100 newtons divided by a thousand kilograms, boom, there's my acceleration. So how does this, which is going to give me my acceleration, how does that acceleration then play out on a velocity time graph? It's the slope of the line. It's the slope of the line, okay. So then I can take this acceleration and continue the story and go, oh, okay, right, there's my velocity time graph, okay? So that's my slope. Now, fundamentally, you have it inside this rocket, you've got a pretty complex engine, right? It's got some valves and stuff. So how do, how do, how do I calculate the force from that engine? Because what's the front primary force of that engine? Get it off the ground. To change the momentum of the rocket, right? So to do that, we have to change the momentum of the gases that are inside the rocket. Because rocket engines that don't change the momentum of gases don't work, okay? What do they do? Well, they look good. Do they change the momentum of the gases? Not so much. Okay. Nice. So when you're changing the momentum of a gas, you're going to create a force. Now, this is on your equation sheet. Remember, force times time equals change the momentum. So if you're talking about a rocket engine, what are you going to put over here? Mass times change in velocity or change in mass times velocity? Yeah, that's going to be change in mass times velocity. So for a rocket engine, this force is going to be a rate function of time. So basically, this rocket engine is going to work by injecting a large amount of time, a large amount of mass per unit of time at a high velocity. James? So how come velocity is in that equation is not divided as well by time? Because you, I'll show you why in just a second. Okay. okay. So this aspect is relating to what's happening inside the rocket <coughs> engine itself. Okay? So basically, the more fuel you eject per unit of time and at a higher velocity, 
And this isn't the velocity of the ship, okay? This is the velocity of the escaping gases. Because if you have like the satellite problem, okay, where y'all did this, you're going to have something like this, okay? So this is the rate at which the mass changes. And that's the velocity of the escaping gases. This is not the velocity of the ship, okay? Now, this, we fire up the engine, and it works, and it's cool. But now we're going to start to change the momentum of the rocket itself. Okay? Now if you look at the rocket itself, that rocket then, uh, hold on, let's on the page. So if you look at the rocket as an entirety, okay, then you're looking at force times time equals change in momentum, which is mass times delta V. Okay? So now we're talking about changing the momentum of the entire system. So in this situation, I would divide that by time. Okay, so now I'm looking, this is a constant mass of the ship, looking at the rate at which my velocity changes. So, if you're talking about the engines, that change in momentum is change in mass per unit of time times the constant velocity. If you're talking about the rocket itself, that's mass times change in velocity per unit of time. So you see the difference between the two? Yeah. Okay. Now. From the very first day you were in this class, way back in August, okay, we talked about this equation that a rate of change in velocity per unit of time is known as what? Acceleration. Acceleration. So this is basically F equals MA. Because acceleration is just rate of change of your velocity. Good, James? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's go back to here. So Lexi said that once I got that acceleration, she said, oh, hey, that's the slope of my velocity time graph. Which is cool. It's a sloping line. So what does that mean your velocity is doing? Changing, right? Oh, that's cool. So if your velocity is changing, what else is changing? <coughs> this is where you have to look at the big picture. Right, we fired through up the rocket. We're going to Mars. Hey, this is cool. It's an exciting time. We've got velocity. It's changing. So what else is changing? Momentum, Momentum right? So. If you were to draw a momentum time graph, that's kind of punchy. What's your momentum time graph going to look like? Pretty similar, maybe? Okay. Now, let's talk momentum and time. Okay. This is going to be important. So, if you were to look at a momentum time graph, okay, what would, the, what would any area on a momentum time graph represent? Well, just look at this. You got momentum, right? Okay? So you got momentum multiplied by time. So if I take momentum and multiply that by time, does that get me anywhere? No. Not really. But what about the slope of a momentum time graph? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the slope of a momentum time graph. Because momentum is measured in what units? Newton seconds, right? So if divide Newton seconds by time, slope cancels out, or the seconds cancel out, I get Newtons. So the slope of a momentum time graph gives me force. Newtons, which is going to be force. Okay? So if I want this rocket to haul the mail, what do I want to happen on this momentum time graph? Do I want it to be a steep line or do I want it to be a pretty shallow line? Yeah, I want <coughs> Dude, I got to get to Mars, okay? I ain't driving to Grandma's house, okay? For Christmas dinner, I got, I got a coconut cream pie in the back of the, of the, back of the Suburban, and I don't want to spill it, so I'm going to drive really, really slow. I'm trying to get to Mars. I got to have a big stoping line. I got to have a rapid change in my momentum. But if you're a safety engineer, and you're trying to keep people safe, what do, you, what do you want to have happen with this line? Shallow. You want a shallow line, okay? Because if it's a shallow line, that means there's less force on the people. So if you're an engineer trying to get to Mars, you want a steep line. If you're a safety engineer trying to keep people alive in a collision, you want a shallow line, okay? And it isn't that in both situations you're changing momentum. It's the rate at which the momentum changes. So for safety reasons, do you want your momentum to change quickly or your momentum to change slowly? Slowly. Slowly. 
Okay? This is why you cradle your, when you catch a raw egg, Ellie Hunt, wish you were here to see this. So, you know, I'll just act like you were here. Oh, look, here's an egg. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Even for dramatic effect, Elion, look, it's in pieces. All right, it's like Humpty Dumpty. All right. So, so let's talk about momentum and time. Okay? You put it back there for you. Yeah. So, uh, what does change in momentum equal? Force and time, right? Yeah. So, uh, if I have a force time graph, okay, and let's say that that looks something like this, okay, so if I gave you a force time graph that looks something like that, Carson Pierce, tell me one thing that you can figure out from a horizontal line on a force time graph. Tell me one thing you can conclude. You know what the force is? Huh? What the force is? What the, the force is, okay. That's legitimate. Let's say that's 100 newtons. All right, that's cool. What else can you figure out? Okay, so let's say the time is, uh, Carson, pick a time between 10 and 20 seconds. Uh, 17. Lord, Lord, okay, 17 <laughs> seconds, all right. <laughs> so I got 100 newton force acting over 17 seconds. So what can we figure out? I can find that area, and that area is going to be. 1700. We're way off the, the two meter mark, which is always the same. Okay? So this area is going to be 1700. This is force measured in newtons and time in seconds. 1700 newtons seconds. Okay, so what does that represent? Change in momentum. Okay, that's kind of cool, right? So the area under a force time graph gives you a change in momentum. Now, can I, do I know what this object is? No. Okay. This could be the galactic battle cruiser. This could be a proton. Okay. I don't know. All I know is that it's a certain change of momentum. So, does this calculation at all depend upon what the mass of the object is? Does it? All you know is that there's a hundred newton force acting for 17 seconds. That is the only thing that you know. Now, let's say that I apply that hundred newton force for 17 seconds. And let's say that the mass is, uh, I don't know, a thousand kilograms. So I apply a seven. So here's my change in momentum: seventeen hundred newton seconds, right? So change in momentum equals force times time. But what else does it equal? Mass times change in velocity. Mass times change in velocity. Okay, that's kind of cool, right? So if I know my mass is a thousand kilograms, okay, and I know my change in momentum is seventeen hundred newton seconds. What can I figure out? Change the velocity. So that's my change in my velocity. Don't not make this difficult. So look, here's my 1700, right? That's going to equal mass times change in velocity. My mass is 1,000 kilograms. So what am I going to do? Divide by 1,000. Okay, that's kind of cool, right? So my zeros cancel out, I get. 17. Right? So my change in my velocity is 17 meters per second. Now, does that mean that it started from rest and ended up at 17? Uh, 10.7. Huh? 10.7. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 1.7. My bad. My bad. It's 1.7. 1.7 meters per second. I thought it was 100. My bad. Okay, 1.7 meters per second. So does that mean it went from 0 to 1.7? Could it? Yeah. Yeah? Could it also have gone from 10 to 11.7? Yeah. 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 Could have gone 1,000 to 1,001.7? 1, yeah. All I know is that this is my change in my velocity. I don't know where I started and where I ended up. All I know is that, my mo that that's my change. James? Is there a way for the graph to show that? No. Not, not on this. Can't do it. Now if, you, now, if you know your velocity time graph, then you could. Okay? Now, what if instead of a mass of 1,000, Let's say the mass is one kilogram. So I'm going to apply a thousand newton force to one kilogram. Now what's going to happen? That's going to take off. So now what's going to happen to my change in my velocity? Huge. So now my change in my velocity here is going to be 
1,700 meters per second. Okay? That's hauling the mail now because the speed of sound is like 330 meters per second. So you're going like Mach 5, okay? At the end of 17 seconds, right? You, this, you're, you're, you are really hauling the mail here, right? So here's my point. In both situations, did you undergo the same change in momentum? Yeah. yeah? But are the accelerations the same? No. Oh, accelerations are vastly different. So let's play, let's play that game, right? <coughs> so in both situations, do you have the same force acting on the object? Yeah. Okay, wow. Now let's go old school. Let's go back F equals MA style, okay? So let's go way, way back in time. So now we're going to go, oh, right, here's 180 force. And in situation number one, the mass is going to be a thousand kilograms. Situation number two, the mass is going to be one kilogram. Okay? Wow. Okay? So what's the acceleration of this thing going to be? If I apply 100 newton force to one kilogram, so help me, if you all do not get this right, I'm just going to scream into the night. 100. 100, right? Okay? <laughs> Not, thank God there was one voice in the desert trying out 100, okay? So this acceleration is going to be 100 meters per second squared, right? So what's the acceleration of this one going to be? Point one. No. Point one. Point one. Yeah. Point one. Right? James with the mental math. Okay, I'm not good at it. James on fire! What was the nickname I was going to give you? Roby. Roby. Huh? Roby. Roby. That was it. Roby. Okay. Now, so now let's go old school acceleration. Let's go old school acceleration. Oh, wow. So let's say on both of these, the time is 17 seconds because that's the number of the Carson Pierce pick. Okay? Sweet 17. Go play the lottery tonight. Pick 17 is one of the numbers. If you win, I get a cut, okay? It goes to the Solar Foundation. It goes to the Solar Foundation. There you go. You guys can just buy all the panels. Screw you. Screw everybody else. Okay. Okay. I'm with it. Hey, you, you realize how much easier my life would be? Holy cow. All right. So, do I know a time? Yes. Yeah? Now, what, 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 what do you want the initial velocity to be? Haley, pick an initial velocity. Zero? Two. Two. All right, two meters per second. She didn't give you any peer pressure. Yes, a girl. Yeah. Okay? So here's a velocity time graph, right? You got to wait, wait a minute. Yeah, I can stick it to him. All right. So I'm in two meters per second. So here's my one kilogram mark, right? So what's this graph going to do? Super steep. It's going to be pretty steep, going up pretty big like this, right? Okay? What's this graph going to do? This one's going to be, right? Wow, how did it get an acceleration in kilograms? Let's try meters uh, per second squared, okay? Uh, so that's going to be pretty shallow, right? So we got a big steep line and a pretty shallow line. Okay, that's kind of cool. So can I figure out the final velocity of each of them? Yes. Yes. Now, does this have a y-intercept? Yes. It's a linear function all day long. And so you all know, oh, I got this work in. I know my acceleration, 100 meters per second squared, okay? And I know that V equals V naught plus AT. And all this is is Y equals MX, right? So because Haley was a rebel and she said, hey, I want that initial velocity to be 2 meters per second, okay? All right, we can handle this. She threw down the gauntlet. I'm all up for this challenge, okay? So I got 2 meters per second. My acceleration is going to be, in this case, 100 meters per second squared, right, times 17 seconds. So James, let's draw with your middle math, 17 times 100, 1700. 100, plus 2, <laughs> plus 7, <laughs> <laughs> 1702. I had you till I asked you to add 2. Okay. You were solid. Until you had to add oh, two. Kind of <laughs> James, if I if I hand you your diploma, I want to ask you, James, what seventeen hundred plus two? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Okay. I'll think about it. Just grab your <coughs> so, <laughs> Come back. Come back. Come back.
On this one, by the way, if I reach your age graduation, y'all better bring a calculator with you just in case. Okay. So, now let's look at this one. Does this also have the same y-intercept? Yes. Yeah? That is the same y-intercept. We have 2 meters per second. And then we've got uh, 0.1 times 17, right? So we've got 0.1 meters per second squared times 17 <coughs> seconds. So that gets us 1.7 plus 2, James, 1.7 plus 2. 3 point, yeah, 3.7. <laughs> yeah, yeah, woo, James okay. smoking. All right, okay. Now, did the kinetic energy of both of these objects change? Yeah. Yes. Yes, there should be no hesitation. How do you know the kinetic energy changed? Because the velocity changed, because the velocity changed right? Was work done on the objects? Yes. How do you know? Because the force force over distance. Distance. forces fly over distance. Now, here's an interesting thing. Could I use my velocity time graph to help me figure out the work? Yes. Why? Because work equals force times distance. So how can I use my velocity time graph to get that displacement? <coughs> Multiply. Find the area. Find the area. Yeah. So the area underneath the velocity time graph gives me my displacement. Multiply that by the force, guess what? Yeah. Work. There was the work that was done. Oh okay? Now, just looking at this, keeping in mind that we're going to have the same time as 17 seconds. So I want y'all to, th to think about this for just a second. Okay? So here's a shallow line. Here's my 17-second mark. Okay? In most situations, I've applied, I've applied the same force of 100 newtons. Keep this in mind. I'm applying the same force of 100 newtons. How could you look at your velocity time graph and figure out which, one, which object has had more work done? What about the area? Which one has the bigger area? Steeper line. I can look at this and go, wow, that area's a lot bigger. Same force, guess what? This had a lot more work on it. Which one went with the greater change in momentum? Mm -hmm. The one with the steeper line, which is going to be this one. Okay? And then you look at this and go, wow, that's 1702. That's how it's male. And that gets squared. When I square 1702, guess what? That's going to be a lot of kinetic energy. Even though it's a pretty small object, it's one kilogram. Let's go with 1,702 meters per second. You get hit with this, it's going to be a bad day. Okay? It is not going to end well. There is nothing good can come of this. Okay? Now, over here, I got 1,000 kilograms, which isn't bad. Okay, 1,000 kilograms, that's a pretty decent sized car. But guess what? That's only going 3.7 meters per second. So, you know, so here's a situation where you have the same force acting over the same period of time. But you end up with vastly different kinetic energies. <coughs> end up with vastly different momentums. And so this is what I want you to see in terms of the big picture, in terms of the final and how you get ready for it. That's what I want you to see, okay? Uh, friction, what? Is there going to be a roller coaster problem where you have to figure out, like, if there's enough? No. Okay. I, I will not ask you to, now, I might ask you the conceptual part of it. I might say, hey, you know, when you're at the top of the loop, <coughs> what are the two forces acting on you know, at the top of the loop? Oh well, yeah, gravity is pulling you down, right? And then you also have to have some centrifugal force. Now I might say, I won't ask you to calculate it, but I might say, if this is going to happen to complete this loop,